Good afternoon and welcome to today's planning committee. This is not a public meeting, but a meeting the public can attend. I am Councillor Susan Durant, Chair of Planning Committee. Before we commence, I'd like to outline the domestic arrangements for the meeting. Due to COVID-19, there is limited seating capacity for attendees at the meeting. However, additional seating is available on the balcony in the chamber for members of the public who may wish to observe proceedings today. All attendees will be required to maintain social distancing rules and wear a mask unless medically exempt whilst moving around the civic chamber and civic building. Masks can be removed once seated. There are hand sanitizers located outside the entrance and inside the chamber meeting room for your use. To minimise the risk of cross-contaminations, participants are asked not to rotate between desks. Please maintain social distancing at all times and reduce movement around the chamber as much as possible. We are not expecting a fire practice today. If the alarm sounds, please leave the building by way of the fire exit through the doors at the rear of the chamber on my right. When you have left the chamber, proceed down the stairway and exit through the emergency exit on the ground floor. <coughs> if there is anybody with mobility issues, please wait in the refuge area at the top of the stairs where the emergency evacuation lift is located and use the intercom situated to the left-hand side of the lift doors to call for assistance. The designated assembly point is the public square in front of Cast beyond the fountain. I would like to inform members of the public and press that today's meeting will be audio-visually recorded and by entering the council chambers you accept that you will be recorded and your images retained and broadcast by the council on its website and YouTube. If anyone intends to record or film any part of today's meeting, please ensure that this does not disturb the conduct of the meeting and you only focus on recording those people participating. Please ensure that your mobile phones are switched to silent mode. May I remind anyone speaking in the meeting that you will need to press the large red button underneath the microphone and ensure the red light is illuminated. This will ensure that you are recorded. The meeting is proceeding today on the basis that all members of the committee have read their agenda papers thoroughly and are aware of what they will be considering today. If any member of the committee leave the chamber during consideration of an application, they should ensure that they do not take part in the vote on their return, as they will not have heard all the relevant information on this particular item. Thank you. Item one, we've got apologies for absence. Uh, apologies received is Amy Dixon. Are there any other apologies? Thank you. Item two is exclusion of the press and public. Uh, there are no exempt items on today's agenda. Item three. I'll refer back to earlier, make sure uh, your phone's on silent. <laughs> Uh, item three, declarations of interest. Are there any declarations of... Chair, can you just say the problem with the camera and later on we may not be able to see it because it's not right there, it might be when it is that it's better to get items to come and talk to the board in the meeting. Uh, thank you for that, Councillor Garth, I couldn't see it. <laughs> Chair, um, I'll go and have a look, see if we can find someone from ICT to have a look at it. Okay. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I'll try and sit still. <laughs> um, item three, declarations of interest. Are there any declarations of interest, please? Thank you. Item four, minutes of the last planning committee meeting held on the 17th of August, uh, 2021. Can the minutes be moved as a true and accurate record? Can that be seconded? And is that agreed? Thank you.
Okay, committee members, I've been asked if we are able to actually swap items five and six round because normally we would start with the planning applications. Uh, therefore, are we happy to take the schedule of applications first item with agenda item six? Is that agreed? Thank you. <coughs> item six is your schedule of applications. The first application is planning application 19 oblique 00100 oblique OUTM for outline planning permission sought for the erection of 35 dwellings with associated works, permission sought for access at land on the north side of Alexandra Street, Thorn. Uh, Gary Ildersley is the planning officer that will present this for us. Gary? Thank you, Chair. Um, just do a quick introduction, uh, first of all, before we get into the presentation. Um, I'm aware that we have had new members of planning committee since this was last presented to planning committee, which was in August 2020, um, which in effect meant that it came with uh, another application to the south. So on screen before you can see um, the application site itself outlined in red, that is for outline planning permission for 35 houses. Uh, immediately adjacent but to the south of that um, was another application site that was for 207 houses. Um, the same applicant that came at the same time. Um, you'll also see on that plan, uh, for the benefit of those who weren't uh, kind of au okay with the application previously, an application directly to the right hand side, um, to the east of that application site, uh, which saw planning permission granted for 28 dwellings uh, originally in 2014 as part of an outline application and then in 2017 with the reserve matters application. Um, planning permission has commenced on that site, so the footings have been dug, um, so it is a, a live permission on that site. Um, that gives you a kind of indication as to where we are location plan wise. Um, Again, just for clarity, the uh, location plan on site here is for the southern site, that's for the 207 uh, dwellings uh, that was granted planning permission, or resolved to grant planning permission back in August last year. In terms of the site plan, uh, it's an outline application with uh, all matters reserved except for access, so planning permission is uh, effectively sought for the principle of development and for access into the site. Uh, the indicative plan that you can see here uh, shows a kind of general arrangement to indicate that the uh, site can accommodate the number of dwellings that have been proposed, which um, whilst we're not here to comment on kind of uh, aesthetics or uh, layout, appearance, those kind of things, uh, it generally looks like it can be accommodated on the site. You'll also see the kind of uh, more permanent um, etched in uh, development to the east hand uh, side which is the 2014-17 applications that I've referred to so it shows those those in connection with the application site uh, this uh, this slide here shows the uh, proposed access which shows a widening of uh, Alexander Street Lands End uh, to accommodate both the northern and southern sites so that the reason the two were brought to planning committee last time was to, to show uh, that they could be adequately accessed uh, and both of them so it shows a, a giveaway junction um, for the development site coming out um, with the priority going into the larger site to the south. Uh, and then just by way of kind of introduction to the site and reminder for those members who can remember this, um, the site itself, this is a view from Alexander Street at the eastern boundary. Um, it's primarily uh, countryside at the moment, uh, given over to grazing of horses. Again, views of Alexander Street uh, and views looking westerly towards uh, the, effectively the BMW for those who know uh, Thorn BMW garage and the railway uh, line in the distance. This is Alexander Street as it appears today and this is the 2017 site uh, the reserve maths application, as I say, has, has got planning permission and has commenced. Uh, so they're the existing properties in the background, uh, 1970s of design. Uh, this is views of the footpath 
looking back towards the development sites and Walnut Road. Uh, so again, just to give that uh, a bit more context. Now, the, the reason that the application has been brought back to Planning Committee um, is since the resolution by Planning Committee to grant planning permission, um, there's been a lot more work done in relation to uh, biodiversity net gain, which is BNG abbreviated. Um, at the time that the application was determined, the calculation used to um, demonstrate how much money was needed to offset the development was considered to be a huge underestimate from what is actually needed in order to deliver biodiversity net gain for this site. Um, as a result of that, uh, we felt it necessary to give planning committee the opportunity to uh, consider that. Um, the good news is that the applicants have uh, taken that on board and are willing to uh, subsume that figure. Um, so the uh, kind of material difference between uh, the previous resolution in 2020 and where we are today is that there has been an uplift in terms of the biodiversity net gain contributions that the developer is willing to pay uh, and will be delivered as part of this scheme. Uh, in addition, the local planners have obviously gathered more momentum uh, since August last year uh, now carries substantial weight, so it was to report that, that fact as well. Um, in very real terms, they're, they're the only material differences. Um, the recommendation has stayed the same in that the recommendation is to refuse planning permission, but clearly the adv advantages uh, that have been brought forward by the developer in terms of um, biodiversity net gain uplift uh, is something that, that you guys uh, should rightly consider. Um, on page 69 of your agenda packs, the uh, appendix four is a draft heads of term and the conditions uh, proposed should members resolve to grant planning permission uh, like they did in 2020 uh, and that could be carried forward into uh, the decision making process. Um, yesterday afternoon I circulated a uh, statement on behalf of Knox Trust which I hope you've had the opportunity to read. I have also printed a copy off and put it on, a, on your desks, so if you haven't had a chance, uh, please do give that a read, but that's obviously in support of the application. Uh, and finally, uh, we have got Helen Markland here, who is our ecologist, if you have got any specific questions in relation to biodiversity net gain. Thank you. Thank you for that, Gary. Uh, do we have any questions from the committee, because we have no speakers on this item? So first of all, have you had the opportunity to read the email and the letter that was sent out? Yes? Okay, so do I have any questions? Chair, it's, it's Amber. Do you want to adjourn for 10 minutes while I sort the camera out? It's, it's now focusing. You're now the table in front of you, so I don't know what. Oh. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, it's now 25 past. So we can resume the meeting. Uh, IT can't help, so we swapped seats. <laughs> okay. So um, obviously we're on planning application number one, and uh, have the committee got any comments? Therefore, the recommendation is to refuse planning permission. Is there somebody to move that recommendation? No. Therefore, is there a proposal to support the application or an alternative? Okay, Councillor Barwell, don't forget to press your light. Uh, seconded by Councillor Potts. Uh, Councillor Barwell, do you want to put the reasons for uh, moving to accept it? It could be that it could be based on what was agreed last time and that they've met the one in six one is up. Yeah, that's 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 literally the reason, Chair. It's already been agreed previously. We've gone through all the motions beforehand, and as I say, uh, all the conditions we've thrown at them, they've, they've accepted. So, can't see any reason to to reject it. And are you still happy, Council Cox, to support that? Therefore, can we have a show of hands, please, uh, in support of the motion? Uh, Council Pickering. Um, Everyone except Councillor Pickering is against the motion. Have you got that? Thank you. 
Application number two is a planning application 20-03191. It's for conversion of former public house into nine residential apartments and a community space within part of the ground floor with external alterations and associated works at Eagle and Child, 2 West Street, Conisborough in Doncaster. And Elisa Murray is the planning case officer that's going to introduce this item. Uh, Chair, do we need to listen to the introduction, bearing in mind what I said earlier about a deferment of it? I would say we do, because obviously your um, decisions, uh, the, the other members have got the right to have an input, therefore I do feel we do need to go the process, and when it comes to you being able to put forward a recommendation or ask questions, then you will be able to do so. That's fair, Chair. Thank you. Sorry, I think that was me more than uh, the IT. <laughs> okay. Um, I do apologise as well. Um, I might need to have a water break halfway through. I've just got a bad cold at the moment. Um, okay, thank you, Chair. Um, this application is for the change of use of the former Eagle and Trial public house into nine apartments over three floors with a small uh, community space at ground floor level. Uh, the community space would provide a space for community groups to hire and would have a small coffee area for the groups to utilise during meetings and then provide a space for members of the community to come and socialise. Uh, the apartments would be one bedroom with parking and amenity space, amenity space in the former pub car park. So um, this is an aerial image of um, the surrounding area. Um, the commercial units follow down West Street to the west of the site, um, and that leads directly into the main core of the town centre. <sighs> Residential properties are located opposite and to the east, and there is a Scouts building directly to the rear. And then this just takes a closer look at the site itself from an aerial viewpoint, so the access is to remain as existing. The car park will be formally laid out, um, and each flat will be allocated one space. The amenity area will be utilised in the previous pub garden with bin storage located within the car park area. So I'm just running you through some photos of the site. So this is um, the building at the time of the application submission. Um, it shows the site access um, and then the surrounding uh, road network. As you can see, it is one way leading um, into the site, leading from the town centre at West Street. Um, and then this shows the um, public house from another viewpoint which is Beach Hill um, the raised area you can see with the railings is actually the amenity area that is proposed and that was the former pub, um, pub garden uh, this is an image this is an historic image captured from 2019 which shows the site boarded up and up for lease um, proving the business has been unoperational for over two years at the least. Um, this is just another historic image, just so you can see um, what it was looked like in 2008. Those commercial units next door are still commercial in nature. Um, as you can see, the render colour was um, white with the um, brick detailing. Okay, and uh, this. Whilst the application has been pending consideration, which has been for a substantial amount of time, 
the applicant has made, had to um, complete some external works to secure the building and to make it weatherproof. Um, Re-rendering has taken place prior to the determination of the application, but it has all been agreed to with the conservation officer prior to any of those works taking place. Um, these images just show the extent of the render, the colour chosen and the roof repairs completed. Uh, so this is the site plan. It shows the car parking and how it will operate within the site with the tracking. Um, each apartment will have its own space allocated. Um, given the site's sustainable location within Conisbury Town Centre, it was deemed acceptable from a highway perspective um, to have one space per apartment. The bin storage is shown, but the full details of this is secured via a condition. And there is no objections from the waste team the highways are satisfied that vehicles can access the site on refuse, vehicle, um, refuse collection days. Uh, bike storage will also be provided internally at ground floor and a condition is included for the provision of EV charging points. The external works include the uh, replacement of the windows, full details of which is going to be secured by a condition. Again, roof lights are also proposed on the rear elevations looking into the car park area itself. Uh, again, the full details of these will be secured by a condition and they will be ensured that these are conservation standard. Um, the re-rendering has been completed, as was previously said, along with some roof repairs, but just to reiterate that these have all been completed in accordance with the conservation officer's comments and there have been no objections from conservation. So to run you through the floor plans, uh, the community space is going to be situated to the right-hand side of the building, um, sort of facing West Street, um, and then there will be three flats at the ground floor along with a laundry and cycle storage pace, space. Uh, the first floor um, will contain four flats, one of which being a studio and another is a mezzanine. And then um, on the second floor there will be two flats, another studio and then a single one bed. Um, there's been no objections from urban design following the amendment, amended plans which saw a reduction in the scheme and provision of storage within the flats. Um, the, studios would, um, the studio apartments would fall short of the nationally described space standards, but these standards do not specify studio apartments and these are still considered to be provide a good level of housing environment and do meet the South Yorkshire Residential Design Guide standards. Um, the proposal does include a, a communal area for the residents um, to have some outdoor seating. However, given its location, it doesn't offer much opportunity for a substantial landscaping scheme. Therefore, the applicant is undertaking a Section 106 agreement to provide eight trees off-site within areas of public open space. Um, these public open space areas are located on Spay Drive and Common Lane. These trees are to be heavy standard and the works will be undertaken by our tree team with the monies provided from the applicant. However, to ensure the residents do have a nice environment to sit out in, the applicant is also proposing some form of landscaping. Now, this is innovative in its way. It's positioned landscaping to maximise the space. And, and it will be similar to these images here, um, but the full details of which will be secured via a condition. There's been no objections from the tree officer. Um, finally, there's been no objections from any other consultees bar policy, which has been fully outlined in my committee report. It is clear from the images that the pub has been shut for over two years, despite marketing not meeting policy 51 of the local plan. It is felt that other benefits of this scheme outweighs this and on balance is an acceptable reuse of a vacant building within the conservation area, subject to the conditions and the legal agreement for the new trees off site. Um, following the application process, there has been a series of amendments um, submitted to overcome a number of concerns that have been raised by myself and a number of consultees. The applicant has um, attempted to overcome all of the concerns raised um, and upon receipt of amended plans, further um, public consultation was carried out with all consultees, ward members and the public. Um, the Councillor Ball has called this application into planning committee. Um, raising concerns on parking, which is a, a fully outlined in my report. And a further reason was that there was an over-proliferation of, of um, HMOs in the area. This application is not for HMOs, it is for self-contained apartments. Um, applica an application for a HMO in, at this site would require planning permission in its own right and would be assessed on its own merits. But just for clarity, I have 
spoken to the environmental health team and have confirmed that there is two HMO licences within Conisborough as a whole. Um, those being located at 1 to 5 Elm Green Lane and 5 Church Street. There may well be some smaller HMOs um, that have been converted, but that would these would be permit development HMOs. Um, there is no um, planning history within the immediate area for HMOs. Uh, I did do that search for you. Thank you. Sorry, I just need to run through pre-committee amendments. I do apologise. Do you have one in front of you? So, um, pre-committee amendments, we do have a change of condition um, wording for condition five. Um, I just wanted it to be clear that we are requiring details of the bin storage for both the residential and the commercial and the community use separately. There is space to provide it. The site plan just isn't clear that it's differentiated in space um, for each use. So just wanted that to be clear. Um, we have received an additional representation, which I'll obviously outline to you now. Um, we have received an additional re representation from uh, Mr. Paddy Corkwell. He has made comments before, um, and his full comments are outlined in the committee report, that, but these have come in following the agenda being published. Um, he was pleased that the cafe is being propo proposed to try and mitigate the loss of any social interaction to the former public house. Um, but the, he does wonder whether the cafe can be financially viable. Uh, he has raised concerns about the exterior. Um, he, he wasn't too keen on the render colour that was chosen, but like I say, it was chosen in line with the conservation officer's um, opinion. Um, and it does raise concerns about the location of the refuse storage and um, residents emerging from the building on West Street. But he wants to support the application, but DMBC and the developer need to engage with neighbours in order to make this happen, is what he's stated. Um, and again, uh, Councillor Pearson has made an additional representation. Um, Councillor Pearson made an initial objection on the first round of consultation. Re I received no um, further comments from him on the second round of, public, of consultation. But he has submitted these for you to peruse. I assume everybody's read them, but just for a gist of it, um, he has said that the, no, the numerous comments have been made by the three mo members. Uh, no plan officer has responded to these. Uh, comments or discuss them in any way. Um, he wanted to attend planning committee, but given the short notice, was unable to. Um, and then he's outlined that there's points of objection. So these are that the building is in an area of a village where no one has a garage to park a car. It's a junction of a one-way system that's put in place to alleviate significant parking and passing problems. Um, there was a major, con major problem with vehicles speeding up and down New Hill potentially leading to an accident if people are parking badly. Um, it seeks, the application seeks nine units. Uh, this means, I believe, as agreed by the council, there should be two parking spaces per unit. This is not the case. Um, therefore, this will mean an area that is renowned for parking problems and damage to cars will be made much worse. Could lead to congestion on the road. That is one of the main arteries into the village. Um, this is also in a non-traffic light regulated area. Uh, also understand that planning now seeks nine units in the commercial community space on the ground floor with the suggestion that this is let out as a cafe and community gathering space. Our concerns again relate to parking and overcrowding aspects of this new community space. Although need may not be an issue, the introduction of yet another cafe seems a project set to fail and concerned that the change of use would be sought in some form to attempt to let the space is also deeply concerning for without the sale of alcohol there are already more than enough cafes to meet the needs of local residents. Um, many residents have asked for on-street parking bays to be created and the properties do re to require garages, parking spaces to alleviate on-street parking. Um, this has also impacted the limited parking bays that exist for shoppers <coughs> visiting the shopping centre of the village, possibly causing even more congestion and local uh, loss of business to traders, especially those on West Street. Uh, we would also suggest that the present design, even the number of flats being limited to nine instead of 11, that was initially proposed would still not have enough cubic space for a tenant to experience good mental and physical well-being so they would not be able to share the communal space area if they were in isolation. Um, the village has unfortunately seen a proliferation of HMOs in recent times, both managed and unmanaged, leading to numerous complaints from our constituents about noise, drinking and social behaviour, drug taking, parking problems, unreasonable yeah. behaviour towards other residents and neighbours. Our constituents and ourselves are extremely concerned by the rise in HMOs being opened 
and the effects that these have on the community. And then finally, obviously there is no green space provision or landscaping to protect the local residents from the noise generated by the new units and will impact on the building next door in many ways, both in both day and night time. We therefore ask committees for, to make a determination that the proposed plan for the old Eagle and Child Public House in its present form is not suitable and that a smaller development should it be encouraged and a re reconsideration of the community space should be looked at for another use. Thank you for that, Lucia. Uh, we've got Mr Paul Hastings, the applicant who requested to speak in support of the application. This is now your opportunity to address the committee for up to five minutes. Please press the large red button when you want to speak and press again to mute the microphone when you've concluded your submission. We will let you know when you've got a minute remaining. Uh, Mr Hastings, would you like to commence? Thank you, Chair. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to speak. It, it won't take five minutes. Does that stop that? Um, my name is Paul Hastings. I'm the owner and sole director of the company that purchased the former Eagle and Child public house on West Street in Conisborough. I have a small property portfolio spread across North Nottinghamshire and South Yorkshire, including some similar developments in similar types of areas uh, involving co the conversion of commercial buildings which we have successfully converted to good quality residential apartments. Images showing the quality of the proposed finish have been submitted to the, Crown, to the Council previously. As the property owner, I prefer to re retain ownership of these properties, rent them out and manage them ourselves. Indeed, we plan to retain number two West Street and manage this property ourselves, therefore retaining responsibility for things like maintenance, the upkeep of the common areas, managing the car parking issues, and to avoid any arguing or misuse over the car parking facilities, as we realize that is a great concern to local residents. Furthermore, by retaining the management of the premises, issues concerning things like tenants' behavior can be quickly addressed, and it is in my interest as the ongoing owner of the building to deal with any antisocial behavior problems quickly and effectively. We have a track record of this type of small development, which means that we've created a formula that we know works, and we have systems, in process, um, systems and processes in place to, de to deliver this. I aim to bring this building back as an asset to the local community by creating good quality, affordable accommodation for local people, and in turn, for the building to act as a conduit to bring good quality residents back to have a greater benefit for the local community. The standard of apartments will deliver good quality design and finish, creating aspirational accommodation for single people and for couples, giving them their own space and importantly, their own front door. Over the past few months, I've worked closely with the council and its various departments to compromise on the original intended scheme. I've been happy to look at alternative options and agree to make changes to enable us to return this disused, formerly derelict building as a benefit for the community through significant private investment. It would concern me that if this scheme were not approved, it would make it financially unviable to it for us to wait any longer to, uh, to undertake things like the additional marketing. And that would be a great shame to see the loss of a building of such significance in a conservation area. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Mr Hastings. Do any committee members have any questions for Mr Hastings? No? Do we have any questions to the planning officer? No? Okay then. Oh. Thank you, Councillor uh, Chair. Uh, yeah, just, re just reading Councillor uh, Pearson's comments, uh, Alicia, um, you know, they seem to be quite upset that no planning officer has responded to their comments or discussed with them in any way, shape or form. Uh, is that correct? Uh... Um, we did receive Councillor Pearson's original objection 
no other objections coming from either Councillor Laney Ball or Councillor Nigel Ball. Um, following receipt of his initial objections, which outlined concerns of intensification um, and the amount of parking, a reduced scheme was submitted. And fo following that amendment, he was reconsulted along with the two other ward members. Um, following that, no further comments were received from Councillor Pearson. Um, then we received a request to call in from Councillor Ball and following that, a very long email chain did correspond to try and get some material planning considerations to call the application into planning committee. Um, during that time, I outlined any outstanding <coughs> issues that needed to be resolved. So there has been correspondence with the ward members and all the time, all three ward members were copied into those emails. Councillor Pickering. Councillor Stapleton. Thank you, Chair. I'm just looking for some clarity on here. Um, I think the Councillor Ball um, outlined the following reason for objecting um, was parking issues and HMO. I'm correct in believing this is not HMO and it's completely irrelevant to what we're discussing. Is that correct? Yes. Thank you. It's, a H, it's not a HMO, it's self-contained apartment. Yeah. Thank you. And secondly, the parking issues from what I've seen is one vehicle is acceptable per apartment. I mean, I know plenty of three bedded houses that only have one parking space. And, and, and I believe the parking is actually privately owned parking spaces, not on public land. Yeah, so um, because of the town centre location, because this is still quite allocated within Conisbury um, town centre, it's been deemed acceptable by the highways authority due to its sustainable location to accept one space per apartment. When the scheme originally came in, it was for 11 apartments with seven spaces. This was deemed unacceptable um, and the scheme was reduced to nine and space found for nine spaces. This has been deemed acceptable by the highways department due to its sustainable location. If this was um, in a residential area predominantly or in residential policy area, I should say, we would be looking to get two spaces per um, two bed apartments plus um, 0.5 space per certain amount of apartments for visitors. But given its town centre location, it was deemed acceptable to accept one space per apartment and also that the building will be managed by the applicant and spaces will be allocated per apartment and clearly marked out as such. Yeah, thank you for clarification. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Anderson. Yeah, can you just confirm that the parking, there isn't any parking for the community space we've made available? No, there isn't any parking proposed for the community space. Um, again, because of its town centre location, we would ex expect um, the people to utilise it to be utilised in the town centre um, and the spaces available in the town centre. Um, if this came in for a um, change of use of a different unit within the town centre for a community use, we again wouldn't expect parking due to its town centre location. Councillor Pickering. Yeah. Um I just wondered um, how many spaces are available in the town centre. Do we know, uh, Alicia? Uh, I wouldn't know. There's a lot of on-street parking within and around Conisbury Town Centre. Um, and then there's a small car park area around Church Street, I believe, and the Sainsbury's area. But I wouldn't know the amount of s individual spaces available for the whole of the town centre. Any other, Councillor Hoggard, have you got your? Yes, I was uh, raised regarding the um, parking for the community use of the community, but also you know, like regardless, you expect people to walk there. Not people in the community will want to be parking there. Some of them may have difficulties, disability, and everything, and there doesn't seem to be much space street parking for them to uh, access that because there would deliveries and what have you, you know, uh, I just, I said, what parking is available within easy access, you know, street parking, what's it like uh, under normal conditions? You know, now, you know, we looked at it, is there adequate street parking? 
so obviously the ward members do highlight that there is an, an, an on-street parking in the area and it is well used. Um, there is on-street parking on West Street, um, close to the site, within walking distance. Like I say, it is edge of town centre, it is at the bottom of West Street, which is what leading to the main commercial area of, Co of Coningsborough Town Centre, and there is parking available all the way down there, um, and on the surrounding streets, um, which are residential in nature, but there is available parking on the streets, um, on High Street and Castle Avenue, which are, again, with short walking distance away. And the other bit is regarding the on street parking in the commercial side. If you have quite a few people start using the community centre, do you end up with a situation that local businesses begin to suffer because there's nowhere for the customers to park? This community area is, I wouldn't really call it as a centre, it's not, it's not large enough. It's, it would definitely be more of a hub for smaller groups to utilise. Um, it wouldn't necessarily be for large groups. It would just be a smaller area for smaller groups to, to, to congregate. Um, it was offered up as an option to alleviate the loss of the community use by the applicant. It wasn't requested by myself or anyone in the planning department. It was put as an option to um, ju justify the loss of the public house because the marketing couldn't be agreed, couldn't be, um, couldn't be fully completed. Um, so it was just to, to help with to mitigate that loss um, and it's generally to provide a small space for the community to come and gather it's not for large groups to use it's not big enough to do that so I wouldn't expect it to generate a significant amount of car parking that would hinder the rest of the town centre Thank you for that Lisa uh, Councillor Cox How big is it? That space? Because I'm, I'm sorry but the the drawings aren't giving much information. Yes. It's 55 square metres. Okay, do we have any other questions for Alicia? No? Is there a proposal to grant planning permission subject to the prior completion of a section 106 agreement and condition? Is there a mover for the recommendation? That's been moved by Councillor Stapleton. Do we have a seconder for the motion? Yes. Councillor Iris Beach. Therefore, can we have a show of hands for those in favour of the proposal, please? So we've got one, two, three, four, five. Six. Can we have a? Oh, did you put your hand up, Duncan? Uh, okay. 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 Can we have a show of hands of those again? Make sure you put your hands up so they can see and count. And abstentions. One. Okay. Therefore, the motion is passed. Application number three. Planning application two zero oblique zero three three zero one oblique FUL for erection of a two storey office building nine point six metres by nine point six metres for a temporary period to be removed by January twenty thirty four. Find this one. No, that's right. Sorry. Uh, Quarry Wakefield Road, Hampel, Doncaster. And this is going to be Nicola Helliot to the point. Sorry about that. Thank you, Chair. Okay, so planning permission is sought for the erection of a two-storey office building to be used in connection with an existing quarry and landfill operation. 
Uh, the application site is located within the green belt. However, as the building is ancillary to an existing authorised use at the site, it is not considered inappropriate development, which but would by definition be harmful to the green belt. Uh, a condition is attached to this permission to ensure that the office is only authorised until 2034, which would coincide with the end date of operations at the site. Uh, there's some aerial imagery there. Um, you can see I've, I've put an arrow towards the actual site of the office, but the wider site around it is that of the, the quarry. Um, this ha you can see this, um, you can see Hampole in the background and also Scalebrook, which just shows you in context of where the site is to the local settlements. Uh, this is the existing site plan, so you can see there in the middle three temporary, uh, temporary buildings which the office would look to replace. Uh, and this is a, the proposed layout which shows the office, which would be where the, the red square is, and then the area where there's currently um, the temporary buildings would be used for car parking. In terms of elevations, the building is 6.1 metres in height with a flat roof, constructed of stone and sited in an area of immature woodland set back from Hazel Lane. The building would consolidate the existing three temporary, uh, temporary buildings currently sited next to the car park, allowing for the car park to increase. The applicant advises that the existing buildings have been a target for antisocial behaviour and are at the end of their planned life. The applicant wishes to retain the other two temporary buildings located to the west of the site for use as toilets and amenities for visiting drivers. So these are the three temporary buildings and then the actual site of the office would be in the background where those trees are. A closer image of that. And then looking back the other way to south towards Hazel Lane. This is also the view towards Hazel Lane. And then this is the other part of the site where you can see in the background the other temporary buildings that would be retained for use as driver amenities. And there's been no objections from consultees subject to conditions. Uh, there have been a number of objections from the public and parish councils as set out in the report. Uh, some note historic activity at the site and non-adherence to planning conditions. However, this is no planning weight when considering this decision. Other concerns relate to the permanence of the structure and its impact on the green belt. On balance, and particularly subject to a temporary consent, the proposal is recommended for approval in that it does not represent inappropriate development within the Greenbelt, and it would not harm the openness of the Greenbelt any more than that of the current situation. The building would be demolished in accordance with the end date of activities on the site. If I can just draw your attention to the pre-committee amendments. Um, there's been an amendment put in there which... Uh, states that following legal advice there's not considered a need for the development to be also subject to a section 106 agreement to require the demolition of the office uh, following the temporary period it's considered that condition two covers this adequately uh, and that would be in accordance with the MPPF there's also further comments submitted um, by Hampole and Parish Scalebrook meeting because these were uh, omitted from the report originally in error so I've set all of those out there separately Okay, so the recommendation is to approve subject to condition. Thank you. Thank you for that, Nicola. Uh, the first speaker we've got is Dr Nick Ballinger, who was requested to speak in opposition to the application. This is now your opportunity to address the committee for up to five minutes. Please press the large red button when you want to speak and again to mute the microphone when you've concluded and we will let you know when you've got one minute remaining. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Nick Ballinger. I'm chairman of Hampole and Scalebrook uh, Parish Meeting, and I'm representing local residents who object to this proposal. There are 25 letters of objection. The main reasons for objections are, firstly, <clears throat> the proposal is in Greenbelt. The much larger two-storey building is over twice the size of the single-storey building it replaces, 184 square, me square metres over two floors, versus 79 square metres on one floor. It will have a much greater impact on both visual and spatial openness. The greater height, volume and the sighting will make it much more prominent and visible from Hazel Lane. Paragraph 149 of the MPPF states that the construction of new buildings in, is inappropriate in Greenbelt unless the new building has the same use and is not materially larger than the one it replaces. 
Paragraph 150 of the MPPF states that mineral, mineral extraction is not inappropriate in Greenbelt, provided openness is preserved. Since the new building is materially larger than the one it replaces, and because openness is not preserved, the proposal is in conflict with the MPPF. And this was stated by DMBC Planning in the pre-application advice. The need for the much larger building is questioned, given that landfill business is shrinking markedly due to increased recycling and that the site is due to close in 2034. The second objection is that the, the proposed so-called temporary building is a permanent and, and substantial construction, and this is simply not sustainable. Paragraph 8 of the MPPF states that one of the objectives of the planning system is to protect and enhance the natural environment. This includes making effective use of land, using natural resources prudently, minimizing waste, and mitigating climate change. A building which uses several tons of quarried limestone, several tens of tons of quarried limestone, as well as several tons of sand and cement mortar, only to be, to be demolished after 12 years, is hardly <coughs> using natural resources prudently, nor minimizing waste. Also, the MPPF allows for the reuse of buildings in Greenbelt which are of permanent and substantial construction. The major concern is that the loophole of seeking a future conversion of the proposed building to another use in 2034 by the applicant would allow it to remain there permanently. This would be in direct conflict with the MPPF and was again raised as a key concern by DMBC planning in the pre-application advice. Residents simply do not trust the applicant given all the breaking of conditions and the issues they have suffered over the years, such as the storage of sterifiber, the substantially overheight landfill, persistently muddy or dusty roads, and commercial litter. These issues are still ongoing now. Many of you on the committee will remember the sterifiber saga and how it earned Hampol the title of being the smelliest place in Doncaster. The enforcement notice to remove all the sterifiber has still not been complied with fully after nine years. Around half of the original 100,000 tonnes is still on site. The applicant has claimed he has insufficient money to deal with this more quickly. Perhaps the money to be spent on this new building could be redirected towards complying with the enforcement notice. Thirdly, the removal of 144 square metres of semi-mature woodland for the building so that the car park can be enlarged is not sustainable. It would involve the unnecessary loss of around 100 trees and would be in direct conflict with the MPPF. The need for this enlarged car park immediately adjacent to the offices is questionable, given that there are large areas of cleared hard standing already available within a 40 metre walk of the offices. See the blue circles on the satellite photo there. You can clearly see there's no woodland and there are parking areas One there already. Remaining. Sorry? One minute remaining. Okay, yep. In summary, if more modern, comfortable, secure, and slightly larger facilities are required, this could be achieved via single story temporary buildings, of which there are many high quality ones on the market. All of the issues raised by residents and the conflicts with planning policies could be resolved in this way. Please reject this planning application on the basis of its impact on openness of Greenbelt in conflict with the MPPF paragraphs 149 and 150, its complete lack of sustainability in conflict with paragraph 8 of the MPF, and its potential to up, open up a planning loophole leading to a permanent building which will conflict with the MPPF Greenbelt policy, which is to keep Greenbelt permanently open. Thank you. Thank you very much. Members, do you have any questions? Okay, thank you very much. Um, we're now going to speak, uh, move to Mr. Chris Ballon the agent who was requested to speak in support of the application. Please press the large red button when you want to speak and again to mute the microphone when you've concluded your submission and we'll let you know when you've got one minute remaining. Thank you, Chair. Um, could, could I have the previous slide back up, M Mr. Ballinger's um, image of the uh, area around the application site? Thank you. Um, the current office and amenity accommodation at the, la at the Corrie landfill consists of, as you've heard, of three single-storey porter cabins, which are each in the end of their lives. 
They've been subject to vandalism on several occasions and attempts have been made to set fire to them. This is a, a rural location which is well away from housing. Um, that there aren't any people living near it. It's, uh, it's difficult to control access onto it and it does suffer vandalism. It, it's not like it's in a place which you can make secure. Um, all of these porter cabins need replacing and the accommodation upgrading to modern standard. Car parking space is limited and the application applicant needs to expand its workforce from 21 to 25. The porter cabins occupy part of the car park area and their removal would free up space for additional parking. If I can turn to the slide, um, you've got three circles, blue circles there. The middle one is next to, I think there are three gas turbines there which are producing e electricity from um, landfill gas produced by the site. I, I don't think you would want to locate an, an office block and accommodation anywhere near those landfill engines, three large gas turbines that they are in containers, but there's still, um, there is still a risk there. So you need to keep um, buildings away from them. Um, the larger of the, the two, three circles, again, it's a bit close to the gas turbine engines. But the main thing with this is you have to keep people and cars away from the quarry landfill activity you can see the, the quarry landfill road coming through there from the top of the slide, which comes out onto Hazel Lane bot at the bottom. There are large lorries moving about on that um, frequently. So you really have got, for safety reasons, to segregate people and cars from the movement of those vehicles. Hence the car park down at the southern end of the site um, it's also surrounded by trees. The, um, the, the, the proposed new office spot would not be any more visible in reality than the existing accommodation because of the trees that are around the site. You'd have to you know, pull the vegetation aside to see it um, or you'd have to be on site and you shouldn't be there. Um, the quarry produces masonry stone and the applicant needs to expand it, I've already said that, sorry, um, which used to clad, is used to clad buildings where the requirement is for local stone. The new office building clad in the quarry stone would be a good advert for visitors coming to the site and looking to use the stone. Although the current planning permission extends only to January 2034, it's not likely to be completed by then. This is rapidly becoming the only non-hazardous landfill in the area, in, certainly in Doncaster. Um, there are some further up into North Yorkshire. Ones in West Yorkshire One are rapidly closing. Area. Thank you. Um, and as recycling reduces the amount of fill going into the quarry, the closure of other sites is maintaining the input. I trust that you'll agree that the new office block is necessary. It's limited in its impacts and it will be removed at the end of quarry landfill operations. There's also, in addition to a condition put on this, there's a condition on the quarry permission says that all buildings, plant and equipment have to be removed and the site restored. A number of the local residents referred to the storage of sterifiber in accordance with undertakings given by the applicant movement of the remaining quality of sterifiber has begun and every single last drop of it will be off the site by the end of the year. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Brown. Uh, we've got a question for you from Councillor Hogarth and Councillor Cox. Uh, just regarding, you mentioned, you mentioned the sterifiber. I'm sure I've heard the promises made before regarding complying with removal and everything. So confidence in uh, that. But you're saying that to, you don't want to put the office building too close to the uh, gas uh, outlets, but 
there's nobody said that you shouldn't put them as, that close to it. You know, and I don't feel that uh, conditions people have got to trust that uh, they will all be complied with them, I'm afraid. Whatever conditions you've got, you know, people have to earn trust and I don't think the past history of this site gets that trust. Council Cox, you have a question? Yeah, thank you. Um, you say that it's going to run past 2034. How long is it going to run for? Can I answer that? Thank you. Um, it, it's, it's difficult to, to estimate that. Um, it will not be completed by then because of the sheer size of it. You saw the, the, the image previous to that one, which showed the whole site. It, it's probably the biggest um, quarry landfill, certainly in, in south and west Yorkshire, um, and it's rapidly becoming the only one left. So it will be vital to keep um, proper waste management going. Um, it's, it is unlikely to be f completed by 2034, so a planning application would need to be um, submitted to extend its life. And if permission is granted for the office, then likewise an application would need, be needed to extend its life. That's one of the reasons why the applicant needs a better building, what, one that will not have to keep being replaced as the porter cabins are. Thank you, Clark. Councillor Beach. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm looking at the objections um, raised by the, uh, the parish council. And I must say, uh, I have a great deal of sympathy for them. But in particular, um, bearing in mind we had a seminar last night about trees and not removing them, uh, I see that you're um, intending to take, tree, take woodland away. I mean, is that necessary? Because we, we are told that we need all the trees, we need to plant thousands of them um, you know, every year, um, and then you, you want to take some away. This doesn't help uh, the environmental situation at all. Uh, and also, um, why a two-storey building? Um, whatever he said, I'm sure that it will be far more obvious than um, than, than the current porter cabins. Um, I came to the site when we had a site visit some long time ago, and um, quite frankly, was appalled by it. But that apart, uh, I know things probably changed. But it's the tr taking the trees away and the size of the building that is bothering me. If you could uh, make some comments, please. Um, th the quarry landfill planning consent requires the planting of, this is a bit off the top of my head, <laughs> but possibly close to 60 to 70,000 trees. The, the trees that will be removed here have got to be, th will have to be thinned, that they were planted voluntarily by the um, applicant. They're not part of the quarry restoration scheme. He made a decision that he'd like to plant a few more trees and put them there. Um, they are not, um, growing particularly brilliantly because they weren't done to a proper scheme um, and they will be a minute portion of all the tree planting that will have to have and has taken place on this site so th this this development is responsible will be responsible by the end for tens of thousands of trees being planted um, I, I've forgotten, you made two points, didn't you? I've forgotten the, the first one. regarding the size of the building. It's to minimise the footprint. If, if you um, if you were to put it on a single storey, then you'd need double the, the footprint. Um, and bear in mind what I said about keeping cars and people away from the quarry access road and the gas engines. Um, this is the best place for it. A two-storey building gives you the opportunity to upgrade the accommodation in a building that's going to last and not have to be replaced again in 10-15 years time. Um, 
and it's in the best in the best location. There's also a condition <laughs> suggested uh, requiring additional tree planting to compensate. I, I ought to mention that as well. Thank you for that. Yeah. Councillor Beach, and then Councillor Pickett. Um, yes, the other thing is... Just one moment, Councillor Beach. Councillor Pickett. Sorry. Just take your microphone off. <laughs> um, yes, which came, came to me while, while you were speaking. Um, when the steady fibre eventually disappears or gets removed, um, what is going to happen with the area where it is, where there's, um, I believe, an illegally put um, base that it stands on? Um, so, you know, I, is that intended to be taken away so there will be more area uh, for use? That, that will be part of the... Um, requirement to remove the building, yes. Um, but one thing that I forgot to say, if I can go back to it, um, with regard to the time scale, um, the landfill may be completed and the site restored, but you can't leave the site. That there will have to be accommodation there for 30 years after after the landfill has been completed because it will have to be monitored. The gas engines will keep going over that period of time. So there has to be a presence on site um, for, in reality for a very long time. Uh, and that will be a requirement of the Environment Agency. You would not be allowed to walk away and abandon it. Thank you for that. Councillor Pickering? Yeah, I'm ju just a bit... Um sort of confused uh, by what you said there about the the life expectancy. Now, it said here the building is to re be removed by January 2034. But when you sort of made your uh, answer a couple of minutes uh, ago, you said it needed to be built substantially so it didn't have to be rebuilt in 10 or 15 years' time. But that takes us to 2034 when it's supposed to be coming down. Have, have I got that right? You have to replace porter cabins every 10 to 15 years. Um, present ones, I think, have been there. That they've overstayed their welcome and they're falling apart. Um, as I said, although the current planning permission lasts until 2034, the site will not be completed. Um, and then, as I also said, there's the requirement for ongoing monitoring after that and the gas engines will be running there'll have to be maintenance there'll have to be people on site um, so the need for office accommodation is going to carry on for quite a long time um, the, the, re the reference to a more robust and well constructed building is to have one that will last for that period of time and not something that will have to be replaced over a relatively short time period and also that are liable to vandalism and arson attempts and so on. Okay, thank you for that. And I've got Councillor Steve Cox. Oh, sorry, Just supplementary on that, Chair, uh, if you don't want. Want supplementary for Councillor Pickering. But, but, but you, you, you're saying that you can't protect the porter cabins. Um, how, how can you protect this building when you can't currently protect the, the porter cabins? The porter cabins are, are made of wood, steel. They're relatively light construction. They have to be carried on the back of a lorry, so the walls are thin. The doors are um, likewise not fantastically sturdy. If you put up a proper building, um, which is of, of decent construction with stone exterior walls, it's going to be much more robust and... and better able to withstand things like vandalism. It would it, be a bit difficult to set fire to it. Thank you. Council Cox. Thank you. I'm getting more confused. We, we've got um, a bit where you just said previously that you'd have to put another application in because quarrying work would still need to be done after 2034. And then you've told me that they will be stopping at 2034. 
but then the environmental agency and everybody else will want to be there. You've just said that. Which, which one is it? Is the quarrying stopping in 2034 and everything being knocked down, or is it going to continue and this building is going to stop for another 30 years after that point? And uh, it just don't seem to tally up. I'm sorry. The um, if you go back in time, the original planning application, which I, I submitted in 2001, Mr Sykes will remember it well, um, the council wouldn't give permission for the length of time that, that was applied for and limited it to 30 years um, in the knowledge that it, it probably wouldn't be completed in that sort of time scale. We, we've got two, two different things here, and I'm sure your planning officers will explain it probably better than me. You have a planning permission which requires everything to cease by 2034, uh, the site to be restored, all buildings, plant and equipment to be removed, but you can apply for planning permission to extend the life of the permission. And you you can't assume that that's going to happen so you've got so like this up permission if application if granted if nothing is done to extend its life the building would have to be removed in 2034 what i'm saying to you is part of the justification for providing a sturdier um, building with better accommodation is that it's like very likely to have to last quite a bit longer than that um, difficult to predict at the moment but by I think it's April 2034 an application will have to have been submitted to extend the life of both the landfill and if this building has been approved the, the building Thank you for that Mr Bond. do you have a supplementary question Councillor Cox yeah. Um, I'll just go back to the application. The application is the description, erection of two-storey office building, 9.6 metres by 9.6 metres for a temporary period to remove in 2034. You're now telling us that that's not the case. I think, uh, I think uh, Mr Bonham's actually explained that what he's stating is at this moment in time, if everything goes as planned, they would have to remove it by that date. But circumstances may change, which is indicated they would have to come back to the council uh, to extend that where it would come back before committee. Um, I'm going to fetch Ryan because obviously he's probably up to speed and knows more about this. Thank you, Chair. Uh, the quarry permission is expires in the 2034 date and the application that's been submitted by the applicant is for the replacement of the building and it's to tie in with the end date of the quarry. That end date is by virtue of the existing planning permission that's there. I think what Mr Ballam has been trying to say is that in all reality, given the increase in recycling and so forth, the landfill isn't uh, taking place as fast as it would to actually get to the completion by 2034. As and when we get to 2034, if the quarry isn't still landfilled and restored, it would then require another application to Doncaster Council and also probably to Wakefield Council because it spans over the border as well to extend the life of the quarry because we don't want to be left with a quarry and a landfill that's unfinished. That would then require an evidence base to say this is how much we've done, this is the recycling, the landfill rates, this is how much we would therefore need uh, in terms of time to see the quarry landfilled to completion. That would be an application. I think then what Mr Ballam's also saying is that at that point, if this permission before the planning committee today is granted, and that has an end date of 2034, and they want to retain that as an office for the quarry and landfill, they would then need to apply to extend that as well. 
So we can't say at this moment in time when that end date is, will be, although Mr. Ballam is indicating things like 50 years or whatever, potentially. What we do know and what committee members have before them is an end date of 2034 at this moment in time for the quarry and the proposal, but that might change through the passage of time. Thank you for that, Roy. Uh, we've got Councillor Barwell, then Councillor Pickering. Thank you, Chair. Um, so, yeah, I'm just a little confused myself, actually. So, as Mr. Ballam explained, in, if the quarry does end in 2034, you're expecting 30 more years of it being manned. So, at that point, if, if you, you're essentially guaranteeing that it will continue, this property. I'm just not, I'm just not quite sure how this 2034 date... I understand it's the end life of the quarry, but you, 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 you're telling us that no matter what, it's got to be manned, according to the Environmental Agency, for an extra 30 years. So this building's going to be in, in, in place till at least 2064, unless you're going to demolish it and then put a porter cabin back again. I, I, I think... I hope I haven't confused matters by introducing the long, longer life. To, as, as Mr Sykes has said, that you have before you an application that goes to 2034. Um, that's the end date of the quarry landfill permission. Um, you have to assume where we are at the moment because there are no planning applications in to extend its life, that in 2034 the quarry will, landfill will have to be complete and the building removed. And if um, the operator has taken the risk of putting a a higher cost building up, that's his loss, he'll have to pull it down. Thank you. But what I'm saying is part of the reason for wanting a more robust building is it's likely to have to last a lot longer than that. Do you have a supplementary question, Mr Barwell? Yeah, thank you, Chair. So I'm, st I'm still very much confused about this. As I say, it's, it seems like every part of this application is on the assumption that it's going to continue past 2034. So even if the site closes in 2034, no matter what, the building's going to need to remain to, for, for man staff. So are you, is, is the intention after that going to be to continue the application, in which case it should probably have been longer than until 2034, with the assumption knowing that it could be an extra 30 years? Or is the assumption going to be to tear down the building and replace it with... A, a single story porter cabin. Um, quarries and, and landfills are different from um, if you want to put a you know, commercial building or an industrial building or, or a house up, that it's, um, they often carry on for a long period of time. Um, and it's di planning authorities don't like granting long life permissions so it is normal um, and for it to be even shorter than the 30 years the operator was given in 2004 to be 15 or 20 years and the planning system looks at that and it knows that there will have to be an extension of time or an extension of area Th that's the nature of the beast i'm afraid and the regulatory regime which is the environment agency that that changes over time and it becomes more rigorous and the requirements um, get, get more rigorous with regard to surrendering um, an environmental permit which is the regulatory regime which is parallel with the planning regime. So I, I just introduced that as an example of how long um, the site will actually need to keep functioning um, at the moment, I'm probably making it even more complicated now, you can't give up a, a landfill environmental permit like this. It could take a very long time. Thank you for that, Mr. Bellum. We've got Councillor Pickering, and then if there's no further questions, we can go to questions to the officer. It's all right. I'll, go, I'll wait for that then, Chair. Thanks. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? Thank you for your time, Mr. Bellum. And we're now going to go to uh, questions for, and debate. Uh, okay. But what I'm going to do is fetch Roy in so he can just clarify some items for you. Thank you, Chair. It's just a brief one, uh, and it's just to focus members' debate. 
I've heard a few things mentioned in, in, in the questions to Mr. Ballam. Uh, there was a reference to past practices on this site and no trust in the operator. Uh, members shouldn't consider that. That is not a material consideration. Uh, you have to proceed on the understanding that conditions are put on, are enforceable and will be enforced. I do appreciate that the site has had a little bit of a chequered history. Nobody knows that more than me in relation to uh, certain things like Sterifiber, which just brings me on to another point that Sterifiber, there has been some discussion about Sterifiber on this site as well, and that isn't relevant to the consideration of this application which is a replacement of porter cabins with a proposed two-storey office building. So I just wanted to make members clear on that before then move into debate. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for that, Roy. Um, Councillor Pickering? Yeah, no questions for Roy, actually. I'll leave you all the debate now, Chair. Thank you. OK, we're going into the debate section now, so uh, over to you, Councillor Pickering. Thank you. Yeah, I, I've heard this. It, it, it appears to me that this is an attempt to build a permanent building uh, on the site. Uh, there doesn't seem to be any reason why they can't carry on using porter cabins like they've been doing for so many years, even if it means buying a better quality a porter cabin or protecting them better. Uh, and the 2034 date really means nothing. It, it, to this committee it means nothing it's not going to be removed at that date it could be removed at that date but of course they could go in for as uh, the applicant say, agent has said for it to be extended so we're not, we wouldn't be giving permission for a, uh, a building to be removed in 2034 at all we're just giving one to be revealed in 2034 and for my uh, um you know, for my, to my reasoning, it's not uh, not sufficient grounds to pass it. Thank you for that, Councillor Pipping. Councillor Anderson? Yeah, can the office just clarify what I believe is true, that we are looking at a planning permission for the temporary nature up to 20, uh, 2034. Any speculation what may or may not happen after that isn't material to what we're looking at today. If they do want to do it, that's an issue for the planning committee of 2034, which may or may not include any of us. That's correct, Councillor Anderson. <coughs> Councillor Stapleton. Thank you. A uh, couple of quick questions. Is it possible to get a slide up with a photograph of the entranceway? <coughs> yep, yeah, that's one. Um, so basically, what we, we the, correct me if I'm wrong, we're being asked to consider um, permission for a two story permanent building, like the one that's on the left hand side that is two story permanent construction. How, how long has that been there? Do we know? No. A substantial amount of time. I, I, I can tell you, I know it's another site. That's been there some considerable length of time. The, so the, the argument about being able to see anything new from the road when nobody lives down there um, doesn't hold a great deal of weight, really, because there's already one there that doesn't cause a big issue. Um, and I, I, I can't see what the difference is between that that's already there and the other one, apart from it's going to be smaller. Am I correct? That's obviously for your judgment, but what I would say is that the, obviously the, the, the recommendation comes with a temporary consent to, to, to 2034, so albeit it's of permanent construction, it's only, it would only have permission until 2034 unless at that time when an application, if an application were to come back in, it was considered appropriate to let it stay there longer. Yeah, thank you. I actually don't really care about the, the nature of the, the permanency or not. To me, I think it's irrelevant. Um, it is what it is. It's going to be to 2034 regardless, or, or it will continue past there if, if an applicant's put in. But just looking at the idea of a building being in there and a few trees being removed, etc., I'm just looking for clarity, really, that objections are on a building being two stories high of a permanent nature don't seem to carry much weight when there's already one there. That, 
really, that's my, my point, really. Um, I just wonder where, how long you've been there, but that's fine. Thank you. I think just the only thing I'd like to add, if I may, if it were an application for a full planning permission with no end date, because it only has a temporary use, and that's expected to finish 2034 at the current permission stands, longer if permission allows, um, I wouldn't recommend approval for a permanent building for a temporary use. So I just wanted to make that. Okay, right. Just to follow on from Nicola as well, the, uh, the, the green belt debate that's taken place as well, uh, the uh, construction of new buildings, if they are linked to an existing use of land, need not be considered inappropriate. Uh, and that is the situation here. It is a, a, an office building. Members still need to go through a balancing act in terms of visual impacts and harm. Uh, that, that, that goes without saying. Uh, and that just echoes what Nicola was saying there, which is if it was a proposal, a full application with no end date for a separate use that isn't ancillary to the use of the quarry, that's a totally different consideration before members. And that's not what we have here. Thank you for that. Right. I've got Councillor Pickering, then Councillor Hogger, and then Councillor Cox. Yeah, thanks for that, Roy. Uh, but surely the fact that it's a permanent building has more impact on the green belt than if there were just uh, portable buildings on the site. That's one for your judgment, Councillor. Uh, you've heard in, in the debate and the questions though, that it's a question of floor space, it's a question of height, it's a question of landscaping, and it's all that in terms of openness, and that's part of your consideration. I, I can't do that for you. Councillor Hogarth. <coughs> Can you clarify that? If this were an application for a permanent building, for exactly the same use, would, the, would you recommend exceptions? And if not, what's the difference? Because you're looking at these, the proposal is going to be 30 years, or 34 years, then another 30 years. If, as it, so, and again, how long is temporary? You know, if it's going to be there 60 years. I think they've actually answered that already, Councillor Garth. I think they've explained that this is a, a temporary one till uh, 2034, and for it to go further, it would have to come back to planning. And if it were a permanent structure, they would be refusing it. Um, so I think that's already been state, being stated. What I'm saying, if it was a per, if it was a permanent as opposed to for 20, 30 years, if it was permanent, why would it be refused? Or why would you recommend refusal for a permanent building and yet it's acceptable for a temporary building? What's the difference in building wise? Um, because the use is only a temporary use, so in, in my opinion, I wouldn't be recommending approval for a, per a building to be left there indefinitely that was, was connected to a, t a temporary use. Um, as Roy set out, the MPPF Allah has exceptions to development in the Greenbelt, and when it is in connection with an existing authorised use, it's not by definition harmful, it's not inappropriate development, which, which is why linking it back to the end date of the quarry, in my view, you know, made it acceptable and enough to recommend approval. I've got Councillor Cox and Councillor Barwell. What, what would stop? I mean, bearing in mind that the end use did come by 2034 and another application were put in for housing, just for example. Would that, would that be one that would be looked on favourably or would that be... How, how would that go down? I don't think we're in a position to answer that, actually, it's Councillor. But we're not in hypotheticals. We're actually judging an application on its merit that's now not foreseen the future, like uh, uh, Councillor Anderson's uh, already said. So, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, Councillor Barwell. Thank you, Chair. Um, just this point in, uh, it's, it's under trees and landscaping. It's 9.39. It does say, however, to ensure the building is screened as much as possible, a landscaping condition is included to enhance the Hazel Road something on the side, don't, don't blame me, bad English. Um, nevertheless, uh, <laughs> when I look, it's condition 11 seems to be the only relevant to trees. However, it doesn't actually say that it's there to screen, uh, to screen the, the view of the site. And plus, obviously, the years it takes to, to actually get a tree to grow to the point that, that it would screen the site as well. I'm just not sure where that condition is. Thank you, Chair. 
condition 11 is for the landscaping. Um, it is a, it's a standard condition, so that's why the, the reason hasn't been amended to purely link it to screening the site. So it's a, it's a generic reason that we have on, the, on a standard condition. Um, it doesn't say just tree planting, I would say that condition, though it is landscaping and planting, so there is likely that other things could be planted there that would assist in screening it from Hazel Lane and not just trees that would perhaps grow, grow faster. And that would be something that when a scheme was submitted, it would be something I'd put to the tree, tree officer for them to assess as to whether or not they think it, it, it's fit for purpose. Never want to miss an opportunity, members, but uh, I, I would just point you to uh, paragraph 8.9, which is the comments from the Trees and Hedgerows Officer. They have assessed the trees that are to be impacted, have confirmed that they are of no value, uh, and hasn't actually recommended uh, the need for any tree replacement tree planting. In essence, those trees, as Mr Ballam has mentioned, were planted very uh, late on voluntarily by, by the developer are of no special interest uh, at all to warrant the need for replacement planting. However, we are extremely conscious, as Councillor Beach has already mentioned, about where we are as a borough and the need to protect trees and plant trees as much as possible. Uh, officers take that seriously and as such, uh, in the case Officer Nicola uh, actually uh, requested from Mr Ballam agreement for some tree planting, additional tree planting, which we didn't actually need following the consultee responses in order to address that borough concern, but it will also address some of the, uh, if you've, I think somebody mentioned, I don't know if it was Councillor Stapleton mentioned that they've been out to the site and had a drive around, uh, some of the hedgerow along the periphery of Hazel Lane is a bit gappy and there's a good opportunity there to actually plant trees to gap it up, which then helps the applicant in terms of their proposal uh, in terms of trying to convince you as members that this isn't going to have as much of an impact on the openness as what's there. So uh, the reason I mentioned this point were more the objections in regards to the, the visible presence of the two-storey building, so the screening aspect of the trees more than the actual trees themselves. Um, so looking at this point it still doesn't it, it does say that you will obviously look at the the scheme as a whole at a later date but it doesn't actually specify anything to do with screening the actual property itself from the the, the main road so that's that's my concern really we could easily make that clear in the condition if members uh, felt that was necessary. However, what I would say, and this might be that you want to make it clear, that the reason to condition 11 says to ensure that replacement trees are of a suitable type and standard in the interest of amenity. Very broad term, that amenity. It could mean many things, and that I could say that could actually include uh, screening the proposal as well, but it could have been clearer, so I do appreciate that. Councillor Barwell. Councillor Stapleton. Yeah, thank you, uh, Chair. I'd just like to go back to the, this this uh, other building that's on the site there. Um, I'm assuming that that building currently, when the, the planning commission or the, the site finishes in 34, that as it stands at this moment would, would have to be demolished. Do we know? I'm not going to say this with 100% certainty. Mr. Ballam in the background is raising his hand, but all I would say is that this seems to be in the area which was the initial part of the quarry, the first phases of it, and Mr. Ballam is shaking his head, so I will be quiet. Uh, I don't want to mislead committee members, so I, we don't, I don't know, okay. councillor. I'm just trying to sort of look at this from a point of view of putting a building there, similar to the one that's already there, um, as to sort of what potential harm is there from a green belt perspective and I, from a material planning, I, this is something that's already there. Um, and I'm just struggling to see, if, that, if the other building wasn't there, and historically we didn't have that building there, I may, I, I may well have taken a different view to this. But as that building is there, and it's of a size and of a construction similar as far as permanency, I'm, I'm struggling to see the reasons for it not to, to go ahead from a material planning perspective. The fact that it's, it's obviously, um, it's ancillary to the purpose. 
of the site already. Um, so I just really wondered whether whether that was that would have to be demolished as part of the original planning permission or not. Because obviously, if it is that again, that would support um, the, a newer building being put there. They'd both have to come down in thirty four. Sorry, I don't know. I don't know the uh, the history of that building and, and, and why it's there and how long it's there for. I don't know if um, if M Mr. Ballam may know. If you wanted to direct your question at Mr. Ballam and, and, and Mr. Ballager may as well. Am I okay to speak? Right, I've just asked for advice on this, and unfortunately, I'm not able to allow you to speak because you've both had your five five minutes. Uh, so. Uh, I'm not able, apologies for that, so we've got no real clarification on that point. The only thing I can do to possibly assist members on that is if you look at page 139, which is the location plan, you will see that there is a red line plan uh, and uh, you, uh, where there's the brick structure there on the photograph on the screen in front of you, that is at the site entrance. Uh, so that is to the left of your Appendix 1 location plan. So that building is outside of the application area, so it's a separate use in its own right. That would be our interpretation with the information we have to hand. So it isn't associated with the quarry. Okay, uh, do we have any other questions for the officer or debate? Councillor Pickering? Just for, just for Roy, if you don't mind, uh, if you, uh, Roy. Um, it's difficult to tell from the uh, drawings that we've got there. Will this be built on footings or a concrete raft? Uh, can you tell us that? And, and how does that affect its future use as Greenbelt? If it does occur. I'm sorry, because I don't have the uh, the foundation design or anything at this stage. That would be subject to the building regulations uh, stage later on. So I don't have any information as to how you know how the foundation design would be at this present moment in time. Could, could you uh, could you tell us then how, how from what you know of uh, the building regulations, if it were built on footings or if it were built on a raft, how would that affect it? Again, that, that's that's not my area of expertise. I'm afraid. I, I would obviously, be looking at the, the building. We, however, it's secured. However, whatever the foundation design is, the way I would the way I look at it as a planning officer is its impact on in, in this instance the impact on the openness of the green belt and its impact on the locality rather than how it's you know how, how it affects the ground. So it's how it comes out of the ground really that is my consideration. Do we have anybody else who can tell us how it affects in the ground? I think uh, Nicola's explained that comes through building. No, she, no, she didn't, Chair. Well, well, I'm I trying to get at the effects. Yeah, but I think what she said is that that is being uh, regarding the actual build and how it's done. It's through building regulations. We've got no report. That's uh, that why I asked if somebody else could answer it, Chair. Yeah, so we don't have that answer here. Does everybody, uh, ask Roy, uh, do you have that answer, Roy? Or does, it, does anybody else in the... I have to admit, I'm, I'm a bit confused, Councillor Pickering. When you say, how does it impact on the ground? What, what, in, in what regard? In, in its future use, Roy. If, for instance, we're putting sort of six, eight foot foundations in, how does it affect its future use as being considered as green belt? The condition would require all buildings. Well, let me get the word in for you. the end of this period the use hereby permitted shall cease the building demolished and all materials and equipment brought onto the land in connection with the use shall be removed and the land restored in accordance with the scheme submitted to and approved by the local planning authority by default therefore any foundations would have to be ripped up and taken out uh, uh, would it then be classified still as the green belt as it is at this moment starting to see where you're coming from now councillor yes upon restoration of the site successful restoration that would then be green belt and it wouldn't be deemed to be brownfield okay do we have any further questions or comments 
Okay. Is there a proposal to grant planning permission subject to a 106 agreement? Is there a mover for the recommendation, please? Is there a proposal to grant planning? Is there a mover for the recommendation? You'll move it. Okay. Is there a seconder for the application? I will second it. Uh, can we have a show of hands of those in favour for the application? Four in favour. Can we have a show of hands of those against the application, please? Any abstentions? Therefore, um, we need a recommendation for those that have voted against the application and the material considerations as to why um, you're wanting to refuse the application. We could well one, one of the things I'm looking at to uh, 5.13, and it says paragraph 147 states that inappropriate developments should not be approved except in very special circumstances, and I don't feel it has uh, demonstrated very special circumstances. Uh, the. the Hear where you're coming from, councillor. However, there isn't a need to demonstrate very special circumstances in this instance because it isn't deemed to be inappropriate development. Uh, members may be in, in their consideration of a refusal probably need to look more towards impacts on Greenbelt from what I've heard through the debate. Uh, you've mentioned things like degree of permanence, uh, impact and so on. I really don't want to put words in your mouth, but those are things that I've heard through the debate. So it may be more to do with the impact on the openness that you might want to focus on. What about, it's quite obvious it's not a temporary building. The intention is it's going to be permanent in reality, not temporary, as of what was being said today. Officers would have difficulty defending that, uh, councillor, because there is a condition on the planning permission that is specifically referring to it to be a temporary permission for the building to be demolished and removed by 2034. So uh, uh, that would be a, a, a difficult one for officers. To, to be fair though, right, applicants already said that they want a, a permanent building so they can push on in 2034. It's not as though we're, you know, exactly, uh, what's the word, guessing there. Condition two states that it's to be demolished in 2034. So as it stands on that permission, it, that's condition two. They've been breach of condition two if they didn't do that. Yeah, but the applicant's agents actually said that that is not necessarily the intention. I, I can understand that, but that is what the condition is. And so if they did breach the condition by not pulling it down, it, it kind of doesn't matter what it's made of, really, because the, in, the intention of the planning permission and the conditions therein are that it must be pulled down. So regardless of whether it was wood or brick or... It doesn't really matter. So they would be in breach of condition, so we'd be able to force against it. Council Fox? I'm, I'm, I'm lost again here because we've got an application here for, to, the, till 2035, and yet there's a condition for it to be pulled down in 2035, but then it may go on to 20, God knows when, but that's fine as well. So, I'm lost. So, the condition means it should and will come down in 2035, no matter what happens ever in, in any other application that would come forward, in any extension, in anything. That is what this application's for. 
for that building to be knocked down in 35. Yes, am I right? At 34, Thank sorry. You, I know. Yeah. But again, it's the application in front that we can only make a judgment on. And as uh, Roy has already said, and Nicola, they do have that opportunity where they can come forward to extend that, and that would have to be dealt with by the committee at that time. If, however, um, they don't and they haven't uh, put in another application that's been agreed, it would be up to the council and its enforcement team to make that happen. Yeah. So we, can, we can't. Uh, make a decision based on ifs, buts, when, why. It's got to be on what we've got before us and the date on the application states 34 and it will be pulled down and that's what we've got to base it on. No, no matter what anybody else has said or inferred, that's the information we've got to ma uh, make the decision on. That, that information wasn't stated or inferred. We were told by the agent that that's, that was the intention so what are we looking at? We're looking at this, this obviously, is, this document is what we've got to take as read, that that is it, but the agent told us otherwise. So, you know, I mean, it's, it just seems a bit cockeyed. I mean, sorry, sorry, Roy, just one second. We, how can we make a decision on something where the information that we're given from the agent is contrary to what the information is within this document? It, it just... I'm just, yeah, okay. Frustrated. <laughs> okay, we've got Councillor Farmer that would like to make a comment as well. Yeah, um, on the evidence what's been given, and we're talking about a temporary building, I do believe that's going to have a greater impact because we're assuming that this building is going to be knocked down in 20, uh, 2034. Therefore, I think it's got a greater impact on the environment rather than placing it with better um, temporary. temporary accommodation. Right. Uh, a suggestion I've got. We, we need to realistically get you to pin down your reasons to make sure that it's something that can council can, uh, the officer can, can represent. So therefore, if we allow you, uh, say, shall we have uh, 10 minutes to discuss between you guys, uh, you councillors, committee members, focus what your reasons are for turning it down. Would that be acceptable? So it's 15.59, so we say at 10 past four. So if you could just make sure that it's clear, precise, the reasons why and the material considerations that you're objecting to. Uh, fellow councillors, it is now 10 past four, so if I can have you seated back in your seats, please, so we can continue with the meeting. Are we ready to put forward your proposal? Councillor Pickering, are you ready? Yeah. Well, the, what, um, what we've just discussed is that it fails policy CS3 of the core strategy uh, that uh, it should not be visually detrimental. Is there any additionality to that? Is that the specific reason? There's no other added reason? A, a loss of trees. Yeah. <laughs> Obviously, we, the mayor wants to plant so many million. We don't want to lose any at all. We don't want to lose any at Greenbelt. OK, so we've got the visual impact. We've got the loss of trees. Protecting the Greenbelt. In, in relation to the, uh, the, the green belt harm, uh, is this the actual document, the, uh, the report that the members have got? Mm. I would just point members to paragraph 9.23 
of your report, which talks about the impact on the openness of the green belt. That makes reference to policy EMV3 and paragraph 150 of the MPPF. And it talks about requiring proposals to preserve the openness of the green belt. Now, the officer has written their report, having assessed the application, and in her professional opinion, feels that it complies with that. However, members where they are at the moment in their uh, deliberations may want to consider flipping that uh, and saying that it would be in conflict with policy EMV3 and paragraph 150 of the MPPF because it, the proposal fails to preserve the openness of the green belt yeah. and that may well answer your green belt query. In relation to the matter on trees, that would be a very difficult refusal to defend at any appeal because the tree officer has, has, has advised officers that those trees recommend no merit in terms of protection or replacement planting and it's only officers working with the applicant uh, we've secured replacement planting but it's not something we could defend at an appeal so my view would be for members to consider uh, the policy EMV3 and paragraph 150 of the MPPF in terms of preserving the op uh, failing to preserve the openness of the green belt. I don't know if that assists members. So therefore, Councillor Pickering, is your motion to reject it based on the MV3, MVP3, 150 MPPF? Yeah. It is. Okay. Can we have that seconded then, please? Can we have a show of hands in support for rejection? Those against? Any abstentions? Therefore, the application is rejected. Thank you for that. Right, we're going to go back now to uh, agenda item number five. I'll give you a chance to flick through to your papers. Agenda item number five. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Councillor Beach. Okay, so we've got agenda item five, which is 11 oblique 00246 oblique EXTM, erection of 112 houses and 84 apartments, being extension of time on planning application 06 oblique 00014 oblique FUM, which was granted on the 9th of April 2008. So I want to pass over uh, for the officer to actually go through this report for us. Thank you, Chair. Um, <clears throat> so this application, it's being presented to planning committee uh, because of an update on the policy considerations and the viability retesting prior to issuing the decision. Uh, the application proposes the erection of 112 houses and 84 apartments, being an extension of time on an application that was granted consent, uh, sorry, that was granted consent on the 9th of April 2008 at Stephen Road Bulby. As a background context to this type of application, extension of time applications were introduced by central government in 2009 as a response to the economic downturn. Um, and it was to keep planning permissions alive for longer so that they could be implemented quickly when the economic conditions improved. Such applications had to be submitted prior to the expiry of the three-year time period for implementation. So the application was originally presented to planning committee on the uh, 28th of April 2015 on account that it made changes to the section 106 contributions. Planning committee deferred the application for an updated viability assessment to be carried out. It was then presented again on the 22nd of September 2015 Planning Committee again deferred for reassessment of Section 106 legal contributions 
in particular for the affordable housing. And during this period in 2015, the viability was vigorously tested as committee at the time were keen to capture some affordable housing for the area. But the development was again found to be unviable. And on the 20th of October 2015, the committee made a resolution to grant planning permission subject to a one year time period for implementation and reassessment of viability after three years. Since that time, the decision notice hasn't been issued due to the legal agreement not being signed. The situation now is that the section 106 is now agreed, so the application is being presented again on account of two reasons. National policy change and submission of further viability assessment at the request of officers due to the passage of time since 2015. Extension of time applications should focus on policy changes or changes of material considerations since the, re since the approval of the original permission. The MPPF is now more recently updated. It places more emphasis on the protection of the environment, particularly with respect to biodiversity. This is also reflected in the emerging local plan. Other issues of design, layout, siting, appearance, highway safety and flooding remain unchanged in respect of the application. However, there is now a requirement for biodiversity net gain. The Council's ecologist has been consulted with the application and um, has assessed the site and it should be delivering between 8 to 12 um, biodiversity net gain units on this site, which would cost approximately 200 to 300,000 pounds to compensate and offset the development. The council has employed an external independent viability consultant who has previously found the development to be unviable. The same consultant has also assessed the current viability to see if anything has changed and again is concluded that the site is unviable and unable to make any section 106 contributions. As such, the policy framework does not alter the balance of the officer's recommendation for the planning committee's resolution to grant planning permission. So the options for committee's consideration today are to authorise delegated powers to the head of service to issue the planning permission following completion of the legal agreement, which is recommended, or for the head of service not to be given authority to issue the decision and the application referred back to planning committee for consideration, which is not recommended. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for that, Andrea. Do any of the committee members have any questions? Councillor Barwell. Thank you, Chair. Um, just, just one question, really. Um, it does say that uh, mechanisms to be built into the 106 Lee Agreement to retest viability again. Is that going to be developed by a different assessor? Potentially, it could be the same one, but we do have um, a number of external consultants that we do use. So... It, it could be someone else, but it could be the same consultant. Do we have any other questions? Can I just raise one point? Um, according to the legal agreement, it says uh, the work had to be carried out within three years, there was no callback, but it would be checked to see if any profit callback for afford would be for affordable housing. So uh, if, if there is no callback, it would be in the form of affordable housing. Yeah, and then all we've got, we've got Charlie and Councillor Fox. Just can you clarify, uh, when we're looking at things like this, does it mean, are we only looking at the 106, but if anything's changed regulation-wise between them being granted this and now reapplying, does the new regulations apply or do they still work under the existing regulations? I, you know, there might be the space standards or parking, or anything, you know, could be anything, but any where it's changed, does that come into effect or do you just work on the regulations at the time this was originally granted? Uh, the application was considered by the planning committee in, in 2015 uh, and at that point, I'll take just for example, you mentioned space standards. The South Yorkshire Residential Design Guide 2011, it would have had consideration to that. 
the nationally described space standards, their data 2015, so it would have possibly been considered or not, but we would have at least looked at the South Yorkshire Residential Design Guide. What officers have done on this cover report is do a, 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 a quick sense check to see if there are any changes in relation to national policy uh, or, or local policy that we need to bring to your attention. That's covered in just the cover report. Uh, and, and, and the ask now is basically, are members happy on the basis of that cover report to go ahead with planning committee's original decision, which was unanimous to issue the permission subject to the 106, or do you want it to be brought back to you for detailed consideration at a future date? Uh, and that and the recommended recommended approach is option one, because we've done the sense check and there doesn't seem to be anything that, that is out of kilter with previous con considerations. But it is in your gift to bring it back to you if you so wish. Councillor Cox. Thank you for that, Roy. That's uh, kind of killed my, my question. But yeah, crack on. Mm. Do we have any other questions? No. Okay. Uh, therefore, is there a proposal to agree to delegate authority to the Head of Planning to issue the Planning Commission? subject to the completion of the legal agreement in line with the planning committee's previous unanimous decision to grant permission on the 20th of October 2015. Is there a mover for the recommendation? Mm. Councillor Ogar, seconded. Councillor Cox, can we have a show of hands in favour, please? That's unanimous. That's therefore passed and permission granted. Okay, we'll go back now to, uh, we'll jump forward, should I say, to item number seven on the agenda, which is the appeals decision. This report obviously is for information only. Are there any questions or anybody wanting to speak on this? No, we're all happy. Okay then. Members, ladies and gentlemen, that concludes the business at today's meeting. Thank you for attending. I'd like to thank everyone for their attendance and input and I now declare the meeting concluded. Thank you everyone.